it has been some crazy college basketball season. My beloved DePaul Blue Demons can't seem to get a game in because of coronavirus. But before you know it, we will be on the road to the Final Four. And the man that will guide us through the Final Four is my buddy from CBS Sports, my childhood idol, my hero, Greg Gumbo. Greg, how are you? You need to you need to upgrade your hero list, Kenny. I'm doing fine. Thank you. No, 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 no. You know you've been a hero of mine for a long time. I can't wait. I'm hoping that we get to the Final Four this season. You didn't get a chance to do it last year. Um, do you think we'll make it to Indianapolis? Because so many games have been postponed because of you know, the coronavirus. It's so, it's so strange. Um, you kind of knew it was coming last year when um, teams started to drop out of their conference tournaments and you knew they wouldn't make it to the national tournament, uh, like Duke, for instance. And the, uh, the athletics director of Duke was the head of the uh, uh, selection committee. And you kind of knew when Duke dropped out that it really wasn't going to happen. And slowly but surely, uh, it, it got canceled. You know, you never know what's going to happen with this thing, as we've seen in all the sports leagues. Uh, I was very fortunate. I went through a 17-game NFL season, and none of my crew was affected at all. There were a couple of other crews that had some COVID cases. Uh, fortunately, nothing serious, God bless. But, um, but, but it can pop up at any time. You saw what it could do to a particular team on a particular weekend. The Cleveland Browns lost all their wide receivers for one game at right. one point. So, so it's, it's one of those things that you go into it with high hopes, but also with your eyes wide open, knowing the possibilities of what might happen uh, at any given time. Now, you came up with the phrase, the road to the final four. How did you come up with that? Did it just come off the top of your head? I didn't come up with that. That, that, really? uh, that no, that existed, that existed probably uh, right about the time that I got to CBS in the late 80s. But I, I'm, not, I'm not sure if that came up from CBS or if it came from the NCAA. Um, but it did catch on, and it does work, and, and it is kind of catchy. And to the point where all the players and coaches talk about being on the road to the Final Four. So it's something that has become part of the common everyday vernacular. Yeah, it's common everyday vernacular, but everybody I talk to says, man, Greg Gumbel came up with this great phrase. So I'm going to give it to you if, that, if that's okay. If there's some money that comes along with it, then I'll take that. <laughs> oh, well, no no money. <laughs> well, then I didn't do it. Now, let me – and I've never told this story in public. So do you mind if I tell it for the first time in public? Right now, right Rob Feeder calls me the voice of high school sports in Chicago, especially basketball, because I'll do color for maybe 50 high school basketball games a year. So someone asked me, how did you fall in love with high school basketball? Well, it goes back when I was a kid watching Channel 5 high school basketball games out of the UIC, the old PE building. Greg Gumbel's doing play-by-play. -play. And that made me fall in love with high school sports and high school basketball in particular. And I tell you, I can't thank you enough for introducing me to high school sports. Once again, Kenny, I wish I could take credit for it, but here's, here's what happened. Um, mm -hmm. The man who hired me uh, was a man named Lee Shulman, and he came in to run Channel 5 in Chicago from uh, KNBC in Los Angeles. And mm -hmm. one day, he just called me upstairs, and this was probably 74, maybe 1974, mm -hmm. thereabouts, give or take a year. And he said, I have this idea, and I want you to take the ball and run with it. And he said, I want to put a live high school basketball game of the week on Channel 5 every Saturday. And I went, okay. So we talked about it, and we realized that it was up to the schools to say yes or no. And most schools were delighted. You go to them and you say, look, we want to change your game that's scheduled on Friday night and move it to Saturday morning. And we would like to televise it live. And it was me and my analyst was Jack Burmaster, who was the right. head basketball coach at Evanston Township High School. And, 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 and most of the time, it went pretty well. There were some coaches who wouldn't change it. Mm -hmm. um, 
I remember God, the, the hottest basketball player around at the time was Doc Rivers, and he played at right. and he pre, played at Proviso West High School. And I don't remember the name of his coach, but he was some ex Marine, and he was a tough son of a gun. <laughs> and, I opened the game and I said, I would like would like to change this game from Friday night to Saturday afternoon. He said, No way. And I said, Why not? He said, He said, if God had meant for high school basketball to be played on Saturday afternoon, he wouldn't have scheduled it on Friday night. <laughs> <laughs> hey, guess what? Not much has changed because we have trouble getting schedules too. But I'm sure we, you, you know, it's crazy. But when I would watch you on Saturday mornings, I just fell in love with high school basketball. I'm like, this is just the greatest thing in the world. So I have to thank you, Greg, for the influence that you had on me because I'm not sure I would love high school basketball like I do today if I hadn't seen you on Saturday mornings on Channel 5. I really well, do. Well, I, I have to tell you, I love being part of that. It certainly was something that was innovative and hadn't been happening. Uh, we, cut, we won a couple of local Emmy Awards for it. But I, but I really think that it's being able to give sports fans just another look. And, and, and look, we introduced our audience to a lot of guys who went on to become famous. Mark McGuire told me years later how much he was thrilled to be on uh, uh, on high school basketball game of the week. Same with Eddie Johnson from Westinghouse. Uh, we had Isaiah Thomas on when he was a freshman. Wow. He, he was a freshman. His team won 68 to 45 or something like that. And Isaiah scored 59 or 68 points or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> and Coach Burmaster said, he's going to be pretty good. And it turns out he was. We had Ricky Green, who, uh, who was at Hirsch High School, and he went on to play at Michigan. We had a bunch of people. And then, look, and we, I, I would look around week after week and see who the hot teams were and see how well they were doing. And if they were, particularly if they, if they were coming up on a rivalry, you know, or a divisional or a conference game. That would be good stuff. That would be good to put on the air. And we ran into a bunch of uh, a bunch of kids who eventually went on to make it big. Right. I mean, it's just a beautiful thing to show high school sports. Hey, now, tell me about the journey. How do you go from the south side of Chicago to the Mount Rushmore of broadcasters? <laughs> and you're on that route, Mount Rushmore, no question about it. That's a pretty good journey. Can you briefly tell me that journey? Well, yeah, and it was kind of an accidental journey because neither me or my brother, I do have a brother in broadcasting. Um, oh, okay. <laughs> but, neither, but neither one of us studied anything close to that in school. Bryant majored in Russian history at Bates College in Louisville, Maine. I was uh, an English major at my school at Morris College in Dubuque, Iowa. Brian got into broadcasting about three, three and a half years before I did. And he called me one day in Detroit where I was selling hospital supplies. And this was in 1972. And he said, hey, they're looking for a weekend sportscaster in Chicago. Are you interested? And I went, uh, baseball, bedpans, baseball, bedpans, baseball. But yeah, I'm interested. <laughs> and, um, and, and so I flew into Chicago and I auditioned with a couple hundred other guys. They said, don't call us, we'll call you. And three weeks later, they called. So I began at Channel 5 in Chicago in March of 73. And I worked as a weekend sports guy and uh, during three days during the week as a reporter and then eventually became the sports director there. And then along came ESPN at the beginning of, or the, the tail end of 1979. Mm -hmm. And they said, how would you like to, instead of doing three minutes worth of sports at 10 o'clock at night, how would you like to do an hour's worth? Plus host a, a weekly show on the NBA, plus do a talk interview show. And I said, uh, I, when I flew out there and took a look, and they said, uh, hey, that's pretty good. I, you know, it was in, it was in uh, Bristol, Connecticut, and it would require a move. But I said, sure, be happy to. So I went to ESPN, joined them, and it was um, – I spent about five and a half years there. And, mm -hmm. and then it was at, at ESPN that uh, I got tapped on the shoulder by Madison Square Garden Network in New York. And they said, um, would you like to come over to the garden and be interested in doing some – 
Yankees baseball and New York Knicks basketball. So I went there. Now I had never done play by play until I went there. And I began really? to fill in, yeah, I, I began to fill in for Marv Albert on uh, on Knicks games. And then I did Yankee baseball with Bobby Mercer and Tommy Hutton and Lou Pinella. And that was my first taste of play by play. While I was there in New York, WFAN radio came into existence. And they called one day and they said, we, and, I, and they said, we'd like you to be our first morning guy. So I said, okay. So I did. And, and as soon as I got there, I knew it wasn't going to be for me. You know, I, I know what sports talk radio is all about now. It's all about arguing and starting an argument or taking one side or taking the other, taking one side just to argue with a caller or something like that. I hated that. To me, that's not sports discussion. Um, and so I, I, I stayed a year. And right about the end of the first year, um, the station came along and bought WNBC Radio. And WNBC Radio came aboard, and along with WNBC came their morning guy, Don Imus. And they said, but we love your work. We'd like to put you somewhere else during the day. And I said, I can't. I do things for Madison Square Garden Network. So they paid me the last two years of my contract, <laughs> and I uh, and I there. Then at the, the one good thing that happened about that, the executive producer at CBS Sports, a guy named Ted Shaker, he used to listen to me in the morning driving back and forth from his home in Connecticut into the city. And he said that he began to like listening to me, how I went from one sport to another to another and talking about all of these things with some semblance of knowledge. And he called me one day and he invited me to lunch. And I said, uh, what's this all about? And he said, uh, I'd like you to think about doing some NFL play-by-play -play for us on a uh, freelance basis. And I said, why? And I, said, what do you mean? I said, because I've never done it before. I've never done it. And they said, well, because we think you can. So they hired me to do a minimum of five games as a freelancer. I ended up doing 11 that season. Mm -hmm. And then at the end of that year, my contract was up at the Garden, and I signed with CBS. Okay. And so that's when my CBS career began. The, the freelancing was in 88. My, my official career contractually began in 89. So that's mm -hmm. how I got to CBS. And I'm you know, there for five years, went to NBC for four years when we lost the NFL, and we lost the NBA, and we lost Major League Baseball at CBS. And then I came back to CBS in 1998. I've been there ever since. Now, do you like the play-by-play -play better than being in the studio? I mean, you, you're so great at both. I like the variety. I, 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 there, it's, each, each, of course, has its set of challenges. Uh, in the studio, you tend to be more of an air traffic controller. You know, okay, your turn to talk, your turn to talk, your turn to talk, your turn to talk, uh, and to try to get them to talk about the things that they do. When you're doing the game, uh, it's a reactionary thing. You can't say anything until it happens. And then when it happens, you have to be precise and accurate about it. You also have to work your uh, broadcast partner into it and be able to, uh, to to work him into the conversation as well as your sideline reporter. Um, I'm not sure I'd want to do it all the time. I do enjoy being in the studio for college basketball, but I also enjoy being in the booth for football. Now, when you do a, a Bear game, and let's say at Soldier Field, is it special to do a bear game, especially at Soldier Field, where you can actually walk from your high school to Soldier Field if you had to? No, I'm not doing any walking from Vila <laughs> Um but, but it's always, look, it's always special to go back to Chicago. I'm never, ever going to deny that. I have to tell you, um, I, did a, I did a Bears game week four of this past NFL season. Uh, it was the right. Bears and the Indianapolis Colts, I believe it was. And, um, and then my crew surprised me. They went and they pulled out um, high school yearbook photos. Oh, this is horrible. <laughs> go, That's not me. That's not me. Um, but but it's fun to go back. And when you're walking through the stadium, you know, there are guys, you'll hear people say, welcome back, Greg, or welcome home, and good to see you again. And, and that's always nice. Look, you know as well as I do, wherever you are, it's always nice to go home, even if it's only for a little while. Well, Greg, what really put you on the Mount Rushmore to me has to be you were the first African American I read to call a Super Bowl. Now that has to be special. 
It was, you know, I've been asked about it and I've talked about it and it's not something that was foremost in my mind when it happened because it's just one of those things where it was circumstantial more than anything else. The more distressing thing to me is that I was also the last one to do it. Mm -hmm. And, and, and there should be a little more diversification than that. There should be uh, more of a selection than just me. Uh, I have no doubt that sometime in the very near future, Mike Tirico will join those ranks. But right now, yeah, it's only been me. Uh, I don't know that I take pride in that so much as just knowing that there should be more. You know, there should be a lot more than that, more than just me. But it, but, but it hasn't worked out that way. Now, a lot of people don't understand the preparation that goes into a broadcast. They think you just show up and do the game. <laughs> That's totally not true. But what is the difference for youngsters that are out there that want to be like you, which preparing for an NBA game as opposed to an NFL game? Well, the first thing I've told people is um, as much as you hate it, and I always hate it, listen to yourself. Talk into a tape recorder and listen to yourself because you're always going to be your worst critic. You're going to be your toughest critic. And, um, and, and, I, I, and the fact is, I still don't like the sound of my voice. I'm very fortunate that other people do, but, but that's a fact. I don't like the way I sound. But listening to yourself, you'll catch yourself repeating certain catchphrases. Uh, and you go, oh, I just said that three minutes ago, or I said that 10 minutes ago. And they, you know, they're like crutches. You just lean on it when you're, when you're at a loss for something to say. So watching yourself and being able to correct yourself is a good thing. Uh, the other thing that, that, that I tell people to do is, um, although I know it's the, it's, the, it's the thing to do, to send in video of yourself, to, uh, uh, to email it in, um, I go, show up in person. It's a mm -hmm. lot harder for a potential employer to say no to you face to face. It's easy to say no to a letter. It's easy to say no to a tape that you've sent in of yourself. It's a lot more difficult. Plus, face to face, you get to sell yourself. You get to sell your personality. You get to sell your appearance. And, and, and those are things that you'll never be able to convey, even in a tape. You know, I don't care how good the tape is. The worst broadcasters in the world can put together a videotape where they look good. You know, mm -hmm. it, might be, it might be 10 seconds of a show on Monday and 20 seconds of a show on Tuesday, all mixed it together. Uh, but the fact is that, that even the worst guys in the world can put together a videotape that looks fairly decent. The, the key is, can you do it? That's, that's one of the reasons why, uh, fortunately, I've gotten away from doing things that are pre-taped. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm a firm believer, and I believe this with live music too, a huge live music fan. Uh, anybody can go into the studio and do it on the fifth take. Or the seventh, right? The tenth, or the twentieth, or the twenty-fifth. Um, Stephen Stills of Crosby, Stills and Nash told me, "You know, sometimes we do it all night before we get it right." The key mm -hmm. is, can you do it live? And when you do it live, you only get one shot at it, and you don't right. get to go back and redo it. So I think that's part of the challenge. I think it's part of the difficulty of the job, but I also think it's part of the fun as well because you know, this is it, and everybody—if you make a mistake, everybody's going to hear it. Nobody does it better than you. I mean, you're on my Mount Rushmore by, by far doing baseball, basketball, football. The other day I was watching the 1990 All-Star game from Wrigley Field. You're in the dugout interviewing people. So, I mean, you, you do it as well, if not better than anybody. But I, I, what I always tell people, too, we just don't show up to games and go. A lot of preparation. I don't think people uh, understand that. And uh, I know you're going to start preparing for college basketball. Do you like the idea, Greg, of everybody now is going to go into Indianapolis? We're going to try to make it one big bubble? I don't particularly like the idea, but I certainly understand it. Because, because it, the part of the charm of the NCAA tournament was the fact that it was spread out across the country. You know, this first weekend, there will be games in Boston, Massachusetts, and there will be games in Sacramento, California. And there'll be chain games in Portland, Oregon, and there'll be games in, uh, in Miami, Florida. Uh, the fact that it was and is such a national event is, 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 is really part of the charm of, of college basketball. Now, 
The charm goes away in a hurry if all of a sudden there's an outbreak of COVID in Seattle, Washington, and all of a sudden right. those games are postponed or canceled or half the team can't play. Those are things that you really can't afford to do. And if you can cut down on that sort of thing happening, then, uh, then, then, then it's good and it's worth putting everybody in one city. And then a city like Indianapolis will be, uh, will be perfectly capable of handling it. It's, it's a great sports town. Uh, there are some wonderful places to visit in Indianapolis. How much visiting will be done during this thing, no one will know. But, uh, but, but, but is, it a, is it a good idea considering the circumstances that we're in these days? Yes, it's a good idea. Hey, briefly, is there a better Sunday than Selection Sunday in sports? I don't think so. And I'm, I mean, I know people are going to say, what about Super Bowl? To me, Selection Sunday is the greatest sports Sunday around, in my two, opinion. Two years ago. Uh, I did a Minnesota Vikings game. And for whatever reason, you know, you go through all of these uh, uh, scenarios and you meet different players. There's no guarantee that you're going to meet every one of them. So two years ago, we had our production meeting with the Minnesota Vikings and I met Kirk Cousins, the quarterback. Never met him before in my life. And um, he walks in and we're, sh we're shaking hands, we're introducing ourselves, and he goes, you are my hero because Selection Sunday is my favorite day of the year. And I went, oh, and, and he said, really? He said, seriously, he said, I love my family, but when Selection Sunday rolls around, they're out of the house. I kick them out of the house. I say, leave me alone. This is what I want to watch. And, you know, and, and I've run into a bunch of people like that, you know? Is there a better phrase in sports than here's Luther Vandross with one shiny moment? You know, that's it's one of those. It's it's one of those. That's the other thing too. Um, one shining moment has become such a standard. And Kenny, people, people who stay tuned for one shining moment after the game is over and after the interviews are done, I'm not sure. I'm not sure they can always see all the fans that are stuck around in the stadium and the players mm -hmm. and the coaches. And it's it's shown on the board in the stadium. And when it starts. Everything goes quiet and everybody sits and watches and listens and some sing along and there are some tears and it is, um, it is one of the most heartwarming moments of anything I've ever been a part of because it pays a tribute not just to the sport but to the athletes and to the schools involved because there's little glimpses of earlier in the tournament leading all the way up to the championship game. It is a... It is a wonderful, wonderful moment and a wonderful tribute to one of the great events on the sports calendar. Oh, I agree. One final question. You've been in the business for a while. Is there one person that you've interviewed that stands out? I would say that there are some people that I have interviewed that I never expected to interview. Um, and for whatever, I don't, I don't know why I never expected to, um, but Muhammad Ali certainly stands out. Uh, he was, I'll tell you, I'll tell you one quick story about him. He was an amazing person, but I wasn't real fond of his act when he was in his prime because he talked a lot he, and it was part of his, it's part of his approach, you know, but he was loud and he yelled at people, he made fun of people and so on and so forth. So I went on the air in Chicago one night. And I said, I said, okay, if you want to know something, take a look at the interview with Muhammad Ali in this month's issue of Playboy magazine and find out why the heavyweight champion of the world is a lightweight human being. Mm. And, you know, some people said, did you have a death wish? I said, well, yeah, maybe I might have. <laughs> so the very next day, the very next day, Channel 5's studios at the Merchandise Mart, I'm walking down the hallway and I look, and here comes Muhammad from the other direction. He was coming in, to do, he was doing, doing Irv Cups in that show. And, mm -hmm. uh, and I looked around and there was no place to hide. There was no place to hide. <laughs> and I leaned back, I leaned back against the wall as he walked by and he stopped and he looked at me. And I went, champ. And he says, are you good with your dukes? And I said, <laughs> I said, do I have to be? And he laughed and he walked on. Jump ahead about 25 years later, 
I'm with two friends at a Knicks game at Madison Square Garden. And um, we're in the lounge at halftime having a beer before we go back out for the second half. And one of my friends, uh, he's a little taller than the rest of us, he goes, hey, that's Ali over there. And Muhammad was making his way through the crowd. And, you know, by now, uh, Parkinson's had a pretty good hold of him. And he was, you know, not very steady. But he was Muhammad Ali. And as he walked by, he stopped and he looked at me. And I hadn't seen him since those days when I was mm -hmm. leaning against the wall trying to avoid him. And he looked at me for a second. And Kenny, he shocked the hell out of me. He said, are you good with your dukes? <laughs> he remembered. And, and I said, do I have to be? And he smiled and he reached out and he grabbed me by the lapels of my jacket. And he pulled me close and he said, you're still pretty. And he, <laughs> let, me go, and he let me go and I walked on by. It's one of the more amazing things that I, that I ever remember, that, that he would remember that because I hadn't remembered it mm -hmm. until he said it, you know. He was an amazing That's guy. Great. That's yeah. just an amazing. But there's one quick interview you did that I, I will always remember. This <laughs> you know, I'll never forget that. <laughs> Ted Giannullis was the chicken man for San Diego. And he was yeah. at Wrigley Field. And I was at Wrigley Field that day. And, uh, and, and I went over and I did a, a quick interview with him. And then I said, hey, when do you leave town? And he said, tomorrow. I said, would you like to come down to the studio and be on the show tonight? And he did. He came in and you know, it was so funny. Uh, Jim Tillman was our weatherman, and he was over in the in, in Jim Tillman's part of the set, throwing all his papers all over the place. <laughs> it was great. It was great. That's a nice memory. Yeah, yeah, I remember that. Hey, Greg, thank you so much for taking time being with me today. Uh, you're on my Mount Rushmore. You have done so much for Chicago. You've done so much for young broadcasters that want to be like you. And we look forward to seeing you on their road to the final four. I'm going to go on a limb right now. And I think Baylor's going to win it all, but you never know. But well, I'll pick an underdog. So and you pick an underdog. Pick somebody who hasn't won a game yet this year. Okay, DePaul, my <laughs> beloved Blue Demons. <laughs> now, that's hey. the underdog. <laughs> hey, it's a pleasure being with you. Thank you for asking me. I'm glad to be here. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Thank you. You bet.